on October 30th of 1996, this happened and was uh, it was in the newspapers in Oregon. Um, Eco terror suspected in fires. This was a building called the Oak Ridge Ranger Station, which was um, one of the ranger stations of the U.S. Forest Service. And if you were involved in the environmental movement at the time, you, you recognized the U.S. Forest Service as one of our biggest enemies. They would take national lands, public lands, national park, national forest lands, excuse me, and divide them up into timber sales, especially after Clinton passed the salvage rider. D divide them up into timber sales and then sell them off to private companies. Those private companies would come in, clear cut these old growth forests and make a killing. And, um, and a lot of what we were protesting during those years in the mid to late 90s especially was to stop these timber cuts to protect these forests. You have to understand by the mid 90s, 98% of all the old growth forests in North America had already been clear cut, had already been cut down. Only 2% remained. That's all that was left. People did a lot of, uh, of you know, different kinds of protest and, and different kinds of resistance to try to save this last 2% of forest that we had that had never been cut. These are um, unique and crucial ecosystems that help keep our planet alive and help keep all of us alive in this world. And they deserve a lot more respect than they got from the U.S. Forest Service. And activists were struggling very hard to protect that. But as you can imagine, if you have any familiarity with any kind of freedom struggle, the vast majority of our public campaigns were somewhat less than successful. And we saw a whole lot of logs being taken out, sent to lumber mills. We saw a whole lot of activists being hauled away to jail. And it was frustrating. So this happened. People thought, well, maybe, maybe you'll listen now. This cost $5 million in damages to the United States Forest Service. And um, shortly afterwards, a communique was circulated that it read in part, welcome to the struggle of all species to be free. We are the burning rage of this dying planet. The war of greed ravages the earth and species die out every day. The Earth Liberation Front works to speed up the collapse of industry, to scare the rich and to undermine the foundations of the state. We embrace social and deep ecology as a practical resistance movement. We have to show the enemy that we are serious about defending what is sacred. This is what it looked like from the sky afterwards. If you can imagine, that is a box truck about the size of a UPS or FedEx truck. Not a whole lot left to work with there. On October 19th of 1998, about two years later, this happened. This is Vail, Resor Vail Ski Resorts. It cost $24.5 million in damages. And the communique that the ELF re released read as follows. On behalf of the Lynx, five buildings and four ski lifts at Vail were reduced to ashes on the night of Sunday, October 18th. Vail Incorporated is already the largest ski resort in North America and now wants to expand even further. The 12 miles of roads and 885 acres of clear cuts will ruin the last best lynx habitat in the state. Putting profits ahead of Colorado's wildlife will not be tolerated. This action is just a warning. We will be back if this greedy corporation continues to trespass into wild and unroaded areas. For your safety and convenience, we strongly advise skiers to choose other destinations until Vail cancels its inexcusable plans for expansion. The Northwest Regional Headquarters of Forest Product Giant Boise Cascade, now, now just referred to as Boise. Christmas Eve 1999, ELF caused $1.5 million in damages and totally destroyed this headquarter building in Oregon. And the communique read as follows. Boise Cascade has been very naughty. After ravaging the forest of the Pacific Northwest, Boise Cascade now looks toward the virgin forest of Chile. Early Christmas morning, elves left coal in Boise Cascade stocking. Four buckets of fuel and diesel and gas with a kitchen timer delay destroyed their regional headquarters in Monmouth, Oregon. Let this be a lesson to all greedy multinational corporations who don't respect their ecosystems. The elves are watching. New Year's Eve 1999, this is Michigan State University. This cost $1 million in damages. 
The ELF takes credit for a strike on the offices of Catherine Ives, Room 324, Agriculture Hall at Michigan State University on December 31st, 1999. The offices were doused with gasoline and set afire. This was in response to the work being done to force developing nations in Asia, Latin America, and Africa to switch from natural crop plants to genetically engineered sweet potatoes, corn, bananas, and pineapples. Monsanto and USAID are funders of the research and promotional work being done through Michigan State University. Cremate Monsanto, long live the ELF. That is the inside. Again, you're not going to get a whole lot of work done there. January 2nd, 2001. This is Superior Lumber. Um, Superior Lumber had a little specialness to them. This is the man who owns the company. This is a still from a video that was mentioned earlier called If a Tree Falls. If you look underneath uh, the head of his stuffed swordfish in his office, you'll notice this, which is a logging helicopter. When, when activists go to stop a logging operation, a lot of times the best thing they can do is block the logging road. If you're logging with helicopters, they don't need roads, right? They fly right over you and take the trees out. You can blockade the road as long as you want. It won't make a difference. Superior Lumber was known for going into some of the most controversial t cuts, in unroaded areas in particular. And a lot of times these areas were unroaded because, either because they hadn't gotten to cutting them down yet, which is unlikely, but mostly because of geographical boundaries, like they're in deep canyons and stuff like that, pr naturally protected areas. So these places were very beautiful, very uh, pristine and special, and they were the last, again, 2% that were left. It's the building afterwards. We torched Superior Lumber in Glendale, Oregon on January 1st, 2001. Superior Lumber is a typical earth raper contri contributing to the ecological destruction of the Northwest. What happened to them should shock no one. This year, 2001, we hope to see an escalation in tactics against capitalism and industry. While Superior says, make a few items and do it better than anyone else, we say choose an earth raper and destroy them. This is March 30th, 2001. Um, what I'll read in a second goes into this a little bit more, but the 35 SUVs at a commercial SUV dealership in, or in Eugene, Oregon were destroyed, causing a million dollars in damages. And, and what might be kind of noteworthy about this action in particular is that prior to this action happening, this exact same dealership was targeted by two activists known as Jeff Free Lures and Craig Critter Marshall. And they were put through a trial in Oregon, and Jeff was sentenced to 22 years for $16,000 worth of property destruction. They were trying to send a message to the movement. They were trying to scare us from doing things like this. So I'm going to read the communique. This, uh, a million dollars worth of luxury SUVs were torched at Romania Chevrolet. Sucking the land dry, gas-guzzling SUVs are at the forefront of this vile, imperialistic culture's caravan towards self-destruction. We can no longer allow the rich to parade around in their armored existence, leaving a wasteland behind in their tire tracks. The time is right to fight back. Romania Chevrolet is the same location that was targeted last June, for which two earth warriors are being persecuted. The techno-industrial state thinks it can stop the growing resistance by jailing some of us, but they cannot jail the spirit of those who know another world is possible. The fire that burns within them burns within all of us and cannot be extinguished by locking them up. In this continuous assault on both the planet and ourselves, SUVs destroy the earth while the prison system tries to destroy those who see beyond this empty life. We must strike out against what destroys us before we are either choking on smog or held captive by the state. Take power into your own hands. It's your life. Just wanted to give you a few examples of what the Earth Liberation Front was doing during the late 90s and early 2000s because it's a necessary context for the rest of what was going on in here. And I want you to keep in mind that those were just a few of 36, three dozen actions that were claimed by the Earth Liberation Front of equal significance between 1996 and 2002. And also during that time, I happened to be running a group called the Earth Liberation Front Press Office, actually the North American Earth Liberation Front Press Office. I um, worked with a couple other people, and uh, we just opened up a P.O. box, and we just opened up like a phone line and um, an email address with a PGP encryption code, and, uh, and said, hey, 
we believe in what you're doing, and if and if you know if you want to pass messages on to us, and then we can relay them to the media, then beautiful. We don't we're not going to try to find out who you are. We just receive anonymous communications, and this was modeled after things that had happened with the Animal Liberation Front and other organizations in the past. And um, and the media were interested. They became very interested. Um, there's one interesting thing about the media is, is that um, they seem to like excitement. And the Earth Liberation Front were very, very good at taking advantage of that. Early on, you would see things like clip art of firefighters' hats that they would put up on the screen. They would kind of advance that when they, you know, they'd add some uh, firemen standing next to some flames. I think this guy's famous. Um, some flames and some matches, anarchy symbol floating over a trash can or whatever that's supposed to mean, catchy slogans. They would take pictures of people who wore masks at demonstrations and then put them up implying that they were Earth Liberation Front members. When people wear masks at demonstrations all the time, especially in the late 90s. Eco-terror rally, I love those. Don't have enough of those. They um, loved the visual stuff. So when you would have graffiti on the scene, you know, they, they would put it up. There would be tons of graffiti all over the place. It would always make it on the news. They just ate it up. If they could get a newscaster to stand next to some graffiti, that was like a good day for them. They could take out the helicopter camera and film some things from the sky. That was another good day for them. They loved destruction and fire and fire and destruction and big fire. And they would do silly things like try to do these really poorly done damage totals that would put on the evening news when they would have a sort of slow news night. And they would actually reprint communiques from the Earth Liberation Front, put the ELS words right up on the evening news, including this one I just read a moment ago from Romania Chevrolet. They would even put the Earth Liberation Front guidelines on the evening news at times. And, and the whole point, if you're familiar with the movement of the guidelines, is that it teaches you what you need to do if you want to form your own ELF cell. I mean, they thought that you know, putting them up, it would create an interesting news story, which of course it did, but maybe for some people, not the same reason it was interesting as what they were thinking it was going to be. This is one of my favorites. The first time 60 Minutes did a piece on the Earth Liberation Front that we worked with, and I think there were three, that I can, if I can remember correctly. Um, they actually contracted firefighters to reconstruct an ELF-esque firebomb. That's, that's what's happening there. Then they told you where the ELF would place it if they were to be interested in doing that. <laughs> then they continued to, they forward to ignite it. And then they told you how high and how hot the flames went after you ignited. You know, if I were to say any of that stuff up here right now, I could guarantee you that I would be charged federally. But 60 Minutes was able to do it. So if anyone is interested, you could probably find that somewhere. And of course, they ate it up when people came on. When, you know, when I would go up on uh, do an interview, um, it was like their favorite thing. They would ask all kinds of questions. They would never want to talk about the stuff that we wanted to talk about. They would never want to talk about the environment and protecting it. They would never want to talk about what these companies and these government agencies were doing. They kind of skirted around those issues as much as possible. But, um, but they loved to talk about violence and destruction and argue with us over the concept of violence and property destruction is that violent and you, someday you're going to accidentally kill somebody and all kinds of other nonsense that of course never happened. So they did a lot of interviews. Um, they would do them on the streets. They would do them in the office. They'd bring us down to their place. They would do it at our community centers. They would follow us to demonstrations. They'd do Fox Live interviews with congressmen who were trying to pass the death penalty for eco-terrorism that didn't even hurt anybody. They would follow us to colleges and do you know, interviews there. It was like they were stalking us. And they would do these lovely types of things too, political cartoons. One of the things that we did when we ran the, the press office was produce about a 15 or 20 minute long video. And you know, part of that, in all honesty, was to encourage people to think about what, you know, what they're really willing to sacrifice to defend the environment. But another big part of it was just to educate the, the average public person about why someone would risk their freedom and their safety to fight for the environment in ways that were considered less than legal. You know, so it was something that both like the, the fledgling activist would want to see, but also the fledgling activist's grandmother would want to see. But that's not the way that the, the media viewed it. They decided to call it the ELF training video, and they would put it up, you know, clips of it like this, and imply that we were doing some kind of guerrilla training in the woods, when really I'm here, I'm walking through the woods talking about 
how it's important to defend the environment and why we need to protect this. But they're talking, you know, but they put it up on the evening news as if it were some kind of like, you know, I'm surprised they didn't Photoshop like an, uh, an Uzi in my hand or something like that. A lot of big stories too, which were kind of mentioned there a minute ago. You know, um, pretty much every major network I, I dealt with at some point. This is National Geographic, and even after, um, and even after I was not officially a spokesperson anymore, they still call me up. In fact, the day before I left on this tour, I got a call again. Um, this was last month with the BBC. The Earth Liberation Front happens to be very active right now in Britain. They just burnt down a 16 million dollar pound, or I'm sorry, 16 million pound, which is over 20 million dollars, um, police firearms and weapons training facility that they were building outside of Bristol, and, um, and that's gotten a lot of attention out there. So they came all the way, you know, all the way out to Burning Books in Buffalo to ask me a couple of questions about it. Of course, there was the documentary that was mentioned earlier, If a Tree Falls, focusing on the Earth Liberation Front. It won at Sundance. It was Academy Award nominated. Um, that's me in the film. Now, the media were not the only people that were paying very close attention. The government was increasingly interested in this stuff. They were increasingly putting more and more resources into it. And when it became obvious that this was a phenomenon that was growing and causing significant damage and more and more people were getting involved and excited and supportive of it, and when it seemed as though the movement was winning, because it wasn't just, it wasn't just people underground who were, who were taking actions, it was, it was a whole very lively, supportive, vital movement that existed and the underground was just a part of it. And so when it seemed like the movement as a whole was winning, was um, growing and, and achieving some significant gains, that's when it really seemed like the government was saying, okay, we're gonna do everything we can to stop this. And publicly proclaiming that the Earth Liberation Front, both before and after September 11th, they made public proclamations that the Earth Liberation Front was their number one domestic terrorist priority. They prioritized it over a lot of these, like Al-Qaeda at the time and Bin Laden when he was alive, you know, they, they would talk, they would actually put more money domestically into investigating ELF crimes than they would that stuff um, on a domestic level. So you have to understand that it was, it, was almost, it was about a decade before any of these significant crimes were solved, and most of them are still unsolved. A lot of them are still unsolved. But um, for many years, they had almost no leads. These people were very, very good at not leaving evidence. And if, you can, if you're interested, you can read the government sentencing memorandum on the Operation Backfire case, and it tells you exactly how they got away with so much. Not leaving DNA, not leaving tire tracks, or footprints, or fingerprints, or anything like that. They were precautions that they took. So what you have is a situation where the government is putting a lot of resources into investigating something that they have almost no real leads on whatsoever, except that there's just some big mouth people out there who keep going on the news talking about how happy they are to see these buildings burn down. So we dealt with the government a lot. There were agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and the FBI that got to know us on a first name basis, whether we liked them or not, I mean, whether we wanted to or not. They would come to our house, they would come to our place of work, they would be behind us in the line at the grocery store, they would be across the room from us. In a restaurant when we were having dinner, you know, they'd be two, three cars behind us at the red light. They were just almost always around, and it was like, it was intense. During that time period, there were seven successfully served federal grand jury subpoenas on the press office, on the ELF press office. Which, so that's between 97 and 2001. And, you know, if, with the resistance that we were putting up to resist all this grand jury stuff, I mean, essentially, constantly dealing with grand jury subpoenas. And those were successfully served ones. In the meantime, in between there, you know, people figured out ways to sort of avoid grand jury service as much as possible so that you never could get served. Um, but it was a constant rolling grand jury investigating this stuff. Um, and there were two full-fledged FBI raids, uh, one in January of 2000, another one in April of 2001. Um, These aren't the worst things that could ever happen to an activist, and I'll go into some more worse things later on, but these are not easy circumstances to be living under for you know, a half a decade or a decade or now going on 17 years. Um, so it, it is something that's very difficult and stressful, and when you have that much attention on you, um, you, know, you, you feel really, you feel a lot of pressure, you feel a lot of stress, you feel a lot of traumatic trauma coming from that. So, um, Let's go into that just a little bit. This is a search warrant. If you look here, this is the date it was signed by the judge. It was good for 10 days. This, act, this um, 
search was executed at 6 a.m. on the day after, April 5th of 2001. Um, they wasted no time. There's my name, other people's names, our home address, our workplaces, and our vehicles are all listed there. This is the front page of the Oregonian, uh, which is the biggest newspaper in Oregon. Agents raid eco-terrorist groups press office for clues on arson attack. It was also made papers across the country and many other places. This fine gentleman seemed to think he was convinced. And you see, you have to understand that the media, especially early on, but the media and the FBI in particular, were, were in the DA's office, you know, um, district attorney, were always accusing me and other people that I worked with the press office of actually being Earth Liberation Front members. It couldn't be possible that we could just receive anonymous communiques and pass those on. It had to be that we were like ringleaders and that we just had to do it, or, or even that we were going out at night and burning these things down and then changing our clothes and showering and going out during the day and being in front of the cameras, which of course isn't the case. Um, but they just couldn't get it through their heads because that's the kind of way they think. This guy here um, has got some gloves on because he's carrying this inkjet printer out of our house at, during a raid. Now, he thinks that there's going to be Earth Liberation Front fingerprints all over that inkjet printer. He doesn't want to get his fingers mixed up with this, so he's got gloves on. He wouldn't find any fingerprints on that besides mine and other people that worked at the press offices. This is a, a fax machine. This is a scanner. This is a keyboard. There's a couple hard drives, there's some boxes of paper files, um, and this is just one of a number of vehicles that they filled up. But you have to understand this is 2001, this particular photo that was taken. And nowadays, you know, we got photocopiers and printers um, and scanners that might have some data storage capacity. They might have a little hard drive inside them, and you could go into that hard drive and you could retrieve, say, the last month's things that were printed out, all, everything that was printed out over the last month. But not, not in 2001. You know, there was no data storage capacity in those devices. They were trying to find those, in those hard drives, they were trying to find email addresses and stuff like that, and they never found them. And we actually have paperwork that shows that they never found them. But a lot of what they were doing in addition to that like, sort of legitimate investigation was that they were trying to take the capacity of the press office away so that we couldn't get publicity for these actions anymore. They were taking away our keyboards so we couldn't type up things anymore. They were taking away our fax machines so we couldn't fax press releases anymore and communicate with the media anymore. Some America's finest there. Um, jump to September 9th of 2011, the 40th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising. And, we are, and now I'm living in Buffalo. Uh, and this is Teresa up here, who will be at the table later. This is Nate and myself and my daughter Eliza. And um, we opened up Burning Books in Buffalo. We figured that, you know, in my mind, it's in the same vein of what I was trying to do with the, with the uh, Earth Liberation Run Press Office, which is uh, exercise freedom of speech that is in support of freedom struggle, is in support of people who are doing maybe things that the media isn't going to represent favorably, but the truth is that they're very important aspects of our, of our movements and that we need to get some truth out there. So we thought we'd open a bookstore, we'd host speakers, we would, uh, we'd have books on things like the Chicago 8 trial, Frederick Douglass, uh, there's a book on the Earth Liberation Front. This book just says freedom on it. Uh, you know, this is Geronimo Pratt of the Black Panther Party. Um, you know, there's a book on the Animal Liberation Front. There's a uh, prison abolition book. Uh, we got like graphic novels on people like Nat Turner and John Brown and Harriet Tubman. And we got posters and children's books stickers and bookmarks and we do a lot of festivals and tabling and we do and we bring a lot of people in to speak. I'm going to mention some of these people quickly. Um, this is Dakajawea. He was a Attica brother, one of the people that survived the Attica prison uprising and he was the person who came in our opening night that we opened the bookstore and spoke. He gave an excellent speech the opening night of our bookstore. Uh, I think about a year later he passed away and we held his memorial at the bookstore as well. Uh, we got there's an anarchist puppet group. There's Naomi, who's in the audience tonight. Um, Helen Benedict is speaking about rape and sexual assault in the military. Scott Crow is speaking about anarchist resistance uh, and support during Hurricane Katrina, which is whirling around on the screen over there. Rod Coronado, former Animal Liberation Front political prisoner. Josh Harper is a former political prisoner with the Shack 7 case. This is Ryan Shapiro talking about the Freedom of Information Act. Will Potter talking about his book, Green is the New Red. Aaron Dixon, the captain of the Seattle chapter of the Black Panther Party. 
You've got Richard X. Clark, another, another Attica brother, Rachel Wilkenstein, who's an attorney from Omiya Abu Jamal, uh, Vicky Law, who's speaking about inclusivity of families in, in, uh, in social justice movements and about women in prison, Peg Millett, who was a former political prisoner with the Evan Mechamiko Terrorist International Conspiracy, which is a, a smaller group very similar to ELF that happened in the late 1980s, uh, Pam Africa, I'm sorry, Ramona Africa of, um, of the MOVE organization, Ward Churchill, Bill Ayers, the Weather Underground, and if you don't remember any of that, just remember that Asajj Kaur is welcome to come anytime to Burning Books and eat our fresh local blueberries. So, so in September, of 2012, uh, a, f a friend of mine who I actually haven't spoken to in an awful long time who lives all the way across the country got a phone call from two field agents, Buffalo field agents of the FBI. Now keep in mind, this is 2012. I have not been a spokesperson for the ELF for 10 years, um, for a decade. And not that I think that they stopped watching me altogether, but you know, I run a bookstore now. I have a family, I have a house, take care of my grandma. You know, it's not very exciting stuff. This person got a phone call from two FBI agents from Buffalo asking all kinds of incriminating questions about me. They were asking things like, am I capable of committing direct action? Am I able to influence or manipulate people? Am I a loner or an extremist? <laughs> Mentioned an unsolved Earth Liberation Front action that happened in Pennsylvania, caused a million dollars in damages to a U.S. Forest Service genetic engineering, a tree genetic engineering research station down in the Allegheny Forest um, in 2002. And uh, in a weird sort of like 1950s way, they said I was stirring up the youth, which, you know, I mean, I actually like to back up at this point and look at this audience here on the right. See if you can find any youth for me to stir up. Um, anyway, they most interestingly really pressed this one question at the end, which was, who can they talk to that specifically does not like me that would be willing to talk to them? Now, if you know anything about the history of the FBI, the history about government repression, then you know, that can really only lead in one direction. And that's the direction of framing somebody or badjacketing somebody. If you're not familiar, badjacketing is kind of like character character assassination or defamation so that nobody in the community will work with you anymore because they think you're just a bad person because of all these rumors that go around. So um, that's not, you know, it doesn't really sit very well with you, especially when a couple weeks later you find this in your mailbox. It says mail watch, it's got my name, it's got a 30 day period right there, which was active when it was in my mailbox. It was then active. And uh, it, show, it says down here, show all mail to supervisor for copying prior to going out to the street. And of course, it's confidential. Um, what had happened in this case is that there was a substitute delivery person that day. <laughs> substitute delivery person accidentally mixed this you know, little memo that they had floating around in the post office somewhere up with my mail and dropped it in my mailbox. Thankfully, I have an attorney friend who was familiar with something called mail covers and did some research. And we found out that this is a mail cover. A mail cover is where a law enforcement agency requests your mail to be photocopied and sent to them for a 30-day period. At the end of that 30-day period, they can renew it very easily. It can kind of go indefinitely if they can find justification for it. And um, mail covers have been used for a long time in US history. They're not quite as exciting, uh, and they don't make the crime TV shows as much as a telephone tap does. But you know, a mail cover is essentially the same thing. It's been used for like well over a century in the US, and many people have been subjected to it, and not many people have found out about it. So it was actually kind of uh, fortunate for me to find this into my mailbox, because you know, they were doing it whether I knew it or not, and they definitely did not want me to know. This man is a US attorney for the Western District of New York, Bill Hochul. Now, he would be responsible overseeing any grand jury investigation that would be going on in the Western District of New York, which, in which I live. Um, and we found out in February, I believe, that a grand jury subpoena was served to a financial institution that my family and I deal with and that the Burning Books, our bookstore, deals with. They wanted everything on us going back to the moment Burning Books opened. And they, yeah, and, um, and they got it. And I do like to point out with this picture as well as 
these ones that there's some similarities. These aren't cameo shots, right? You know, these people, I mean, they essentially look the same. Looks like they get their hair cut the same way. They've got the same suits on. And most significantly, they've got the same flag draped behind them that we saw waving in the wind as you know, Manifest Destiny progress, progressed across the United States and that was waving over slave plantation and has a long, bloody, horrible history and they're sitting there with smiles like that on their faces. It's very obvious, they're sending a very obvious, so obvious that it's almost subliminal kind of message that they're saying right here. And I think that we all kind of get what it is that they are and what they do. Uh, a few weeks after I found out about the grand jury subpoena, I tried to get on an airplane I did get on an airplane going across country to table at a book fair for burning books. Much criminal activity happening there, and I find this is on my ticket. Here's a better view. It stands for Secondary Security Screening Selection. It's better known as the Select D list. It's not as well known as the Do Not Fly list, but there are, uh, last time they admitted it, there were 13 to 14,000 Americans on that list. And what they do is they try to sneak it in there. Um, and, make, and when they execute the search, they, they require you to mandate you to go through every single security screening that they have. So you know that, that giant box you go in and you know, it takes a somewhat nude photograph of you when you walk in there and those things that occasionally people get like chemical swabs wiped on their shoes and stuff. You're forced, if you're on the select D list, you're forced to go through that every time. And they'll act like, if you don't know better, they'll act like it's random. They'll act like you were randomly pulled aside. They won't really let on that you're actually on this list unless you know to look for these letters on your ticket, you know, amongst all these other random numbers and letters that are on this ticket. So after we found out about those four things, we got a legal team together and, uh, you know, we got some media people on there as well, sort of a public outreach and legal team together, and we figured that's enough, you know. I'm somebody who exercises free speech. Um, I understand that, I, that I'm radical. I'm not trying to look like I'm not radical. Um, I understand that the government doesn't like what I say. I'm not trying to convince them to like what I say. Nonetheless, uh, freedom of speech is, is, is made, it, you know, they claim that it ex exists specifically for people that fit those conditions, right? And uh, rather than being intimidated and scared and frightened and just like kind of shaking in my, you know, shorts, hoping that they don't indict me for something, we figured we'd do a public campaign. It seemed to make a lot more sense to fight back and, and show an example of somebody who's resisting surveillance and investigation and is not afraid to make a big deal out of it. So we threw a fundraiser at this place right here, which, was called, which is called the First Amendment Club. It's a private club in Buffalo that happened to have an excellent name, and we threw a fundraiser there. A couple hundred people came out. We raised enough money to launch our campaign, which is what I'll be talking about. Um, we. Um, Got a lot of media. This one's called, it's a front page article of the weekly paper, USA versus Leslie James Pickering. It's flattering. Um, it's a front page article on May Day of 2013, which has this excellent Black Panther poster in the background. Again, I liked that a lot. Singled out for his radical past. And this is a front page New York Times article on the 4th of July of 2013, which included not only a photo of me in front of burning books, which we love to get that exposure, but, um, but uh, you know, they printed the Mailwatch memo on there, and if you went to their website, they had a lot more than just the Mailwatch memo on there. They had a whole lot of documents that we had achieved at that point. Uh, and when the New York Times has a story, it shares it uh, the same way any news wire service was, so, so newspapers across the country would print it as well. Um, this one here is in Santa Rosa, California. Um, and I'd like to, here we go. I'd like to point out that the next day this nice little letter to the editor was written in, or maybe it wasn't the next day, but it was in, within the next couple days. And it reads, well, clearly this man is a threat. In the photo, a volume of Robin Hood is clearly visible in his bookstore. <laughs> the anarchy and overthrowing of the government advocated in that book show he must be a terrorist. <laughs> and I know it's hard to see, but right there is a copy of Robin Hood. Uh, there was a surprisingly supportive NBC Nightly News story on the situation. And then we kind of moved on to doing something else. Um, you know, the government, and, and you know, if you go through grade school, public school in, in this country, you know, you, you sort of understand that there's these legal ways that you can go about, like, um, dealing with your grievances. There's congressmen you can write. There's, there's committees that exist in, in bodies of government that deal with uh, constitutional um, infringements and things like that. So we wrote everyone that we could think of with formal, formal complaints and otherwise just would send them a formal letter. 
Um, and we wrote, Senator Chairman Leahy and Senator Grassley of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary, Senator Durbin, Chairman Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Human Rights, Tom Carper, Chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Kristen Gillibrand, represents Buffalo in the U.S. Senate, Rand Paul, U.S. Senator who's known for being a champion of constitutional rights, allegedly, Blake Farenhold, Chairman House Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce and the U.S. Postal Service and the Census, Mary Ann Gibbons, General Counsel and Vice President of the U.S. Postal Service, Inspector Michael Horowitz of the U.S. Department of Justice. We did, um, we did take the initial step with the, with the Homeland Security, which oversees the Transportation Security Administration regarding the selectee list. And they got back to us right away with this huge form where they wanted us to fill out all of my associates and all their social security numbers and home addresses, and I didn't take that any farther than that. Obviously, that's a bunch of nonsense that we weren't going to cooperate with. Um, and we did have a little bit of fruitless sort of back and forth with the U.S. Attorney General's office. Um, and what you're seeing up here right now is the only thing out of all these letters that went anywhere. Uh, Chuck Schumer's office, a senator, uh, wrote uh, someone who, if, at the U.S. Post Office saying, what gives? You know, we saw the article in the New York Times. We know about the situation. This person is our constituent. Can you please tell us why this person is being investigated or what's going on? Post Office never responded. And I don't want to act like I'm surprised because um, I'm not. In fact, I, I, what, the, the only thing that was surprising me is that this, this one letter was actually sent. Uh, you know, it wasn't so much that I believed that these things were going to solve any of the problems that we're dealing with as much as I wanted to exhaust every single possible way to deal with this. And, uh, and so we did that. In 1971, a group called the Citizens Commission, Commission to investigate the FBI broke into an FBI office in Pennsylvania, a little town called Media outside of Philadelphia, and they stole every single document that was in the place. And they got away with it. They, um, they, they, they then took it up to a, a cabin that they had, and they, and they spent like a couple weeks going through all these documents mimeographing them because it's before co copy machines, and then sending packets of, of these copies out to various uh, news agencies and exposed a whole lot of really horrible stuff that the FBI was doing to people who were working for, for freedom and social justice, people who were working to stop the Vietnam War, or civil rights activists, or Black Liberation, Black Panther Party, etc. And in one of these pages in th that they found, there was a word that they, no one had ever heard before. Well, some people had, but general public hadn't heard before, which was COINTELPRO which is an FBI code word for counterintelligence program. Because they, they did that, they broke into the office, violated the law. Um, you know, it's the only reason that we know anything about COINTELPRO and about a whole lot of really evil things, horrible things that the government has done to people who work for social justice, who work for freedom. Um, and following that up, a number of activists and um, journalists and other people started filing Freedom of Information Act requests around COINTELPRO and around a whole lot of other things, but especially COINTELPRO. And if you're not familiar, Freedom of Information Act is a, is a federal law that it says that because these, these government agencies are working for us, that we have a right to know what they have on their, in their files. And uh, now that we knew what to ask for with COINTELPRO, people sent in requests, and, and that helped expose a lot more really horrible things that the government was doing, the FBI was doing in particular under the, under the, you know, the banner of COINTELPRO, which also led to the church hearings. This is uh, Senator Frank Church in 1975. They actually had governmental hearings on, on some of the you know, illegal and, and many times violent things that the, that the FBI in particular, but also the, the CIA was doing um, you know, to, to people who were working for change. And, um, very briefly, just to give you a context, because I don't want to make it look like this is an isolated incident that I'm experiencing, and I also don't want it to, to make it look like I'm the worst person to ever receive any repression. I'm standing here, I'm free, I'm, I'm happy to talk with you tonight. I want you to know about what I'm doing, but I also want you to have a realistic understanding of what this government is capable to do when it feels like it's forced to do so. This is Fred Hampton. He's the chairman of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. The FBI, in their COINTELPRO documents, had an explicit goal to prevent the rise of a black messiah like Malcolm X. 
Malcolm X was already killed at this point, and they did not want another person that they considered to be a black messiah to rise up and lead people to struggle for freedom and justice. And they were worried that, that uh, Fred was their man. But they, did not, they did not want to see him live past age 21. They had a man named William O'Neill working for them. And, uh, and he was also undercover working in the Chicago Black, Chapter, uh, Black Panther Party. And he was pretty, pretty high up in the ranks. He, he supplied this nice little drawing to the FBI, who supplied it to the Chicago Police Department. It featured Fred Hampton's, the location of Fred Hampton's bed and locations of all the doors and everything else in the apartment. Um, they also supplied false information about the Panthers stockpiling massive amounts of illegal weapons. You know, they did have some weapons. They were the Black Panther Party, but you know, they're you know, legally registered weapons. They weren't stockpiling an arsenal in, the, in, that, in Fred's apartment. That would have been ridiculous. Um, and their response was this. These people who work for us, who represent our best interests, who operate on our tax dollars, decided that they would raid. And they started off the raid with the machine gun leveled at the waist outside the wall in the hallway of the apartment, shooting into the apartment from the hallway before they even announced themselves. Mark Clark, who was another Black Panther, was killed almost immediately from that. Fred Hampton was killed in his bed. And just to make sure he was dead, this is his bed. And I'm sorry if this is disturbing for anyone besides me. Um, there's bullet holes in the wall. That's blood. Um, just to make sure he was dead, they went into the room and they, they killed him point blank with some more shots to the head. And then they said, he's good and dead now. And then as if that wasn't enough, they dragged him out of his body out of the building and smiled for the newspapers. This is just one of many, many incidences that happened under the banner of COINTELPRO. And this is what this, this lovely government is capable of doing when it wants to. In my case, we also use the Freedom of Information Act. In fact, it's been our main staging ground so far is using the Freedom of Information Act. We use the Freedom of Information Act on the US Post Office. And what you see here are some examples of the mail that was photocopying during that 30-day period. Um, and then you, you found such incriminating things as correspondence from the tombstone engraving company that I was dealing with regarding my, the, my grandfather's burial and the engraving on his tombstone. Postcard from my stepfather, student loan bill. This one here is the one I'm most ashamed of. It's an Amazon.com order. <laughs> this is correspondence from a nursing home that I was dealing with, a family member in a nursing home at the time. Uh, this here is kind of funny. This is the US Department of Justice. I was already using the Freedom of Information Act to get uh, files on people that I was doing research and, and writing projects on. So the, the, the Justice Department had actually contracted the post office to photocopy the letter that the Justice Department had sent to me through the post office. So it was just like this ironic cycle of like, I'm going to send this and get an extra copy. It's just madness. This here's my water bill. This here says legal mail. And it was sent from one of my attorneys. Um, it's an additional violation to tamper with legal mail. Now, we didn't ask them to send photocopies of the exact same mail that I had already received. That's not what we were looking for. And people who use the Freedom of Information Act, the vast majority of them are just happy with whatever they get right off the bat. Right? They just they think, oh, wow, they actually sent me six pages of something. This must be all they have, or this must be the extent of everything. No. If you really want to try to get which, everything you can get, which I can guarantee will not be everything, but everything that you can get, you need to appeal and you need to sue. And so we appealed immediately. And they sent us just a little bit more information. They took those, those letters and put them into weekly packets, apparently, and then put a cover letter, letter on them and sent those weekly packets with the cover letter to this office in Chicago, which is underneath the, um, which is part of the post, post office and uh, the USPS. And then they would send it from there off to whatever law enforcement agency. They, you know, they apparently have many mail covers. And they have, a, have to have a whole office in Chicago just to process them. So we didn't know anything about that. It also says here, this is highlighter. I know it looks black because it's photocopied, but it's highlighter and you can still read it. It says, compromise of this mail cover may result in disciplinary action. They're not excited about these things being exposed. We also use the Freedom of Information Act on the Transportation Security Administration. This is what we got back here. And to help explain some of these documents, 
These black rectangles are called redactions. They don't want you to see what's under that, so they won't let you see it. And these red letters on top of them, those are exemptions that exist under the Freedom of Information Act. So they're saying B3, exemption B3, blah, blah, blah. This is the reason why we're not letting you see that. It can be a whole lot of you know, exposing investigative techniques. It can be national security risk exemption. There's a whole lot of exemptions. Um, but I'm going to read a little bit of what is in here. At 640 at the Buffalo Niagara International Airport, Gate 12, or Gate 21, depending on which part you're looking at. Now see, if, up here it says 12, down here it says 21, and, and I, I can't help but pointing out every time this comes up, I mean, these people are essentially like cops. You know, like if you can picture a cop busting somebody and sending them, you know, and, and you know, the, the, the exciting part of their job is like chasing someone and arresting them and, you know, saying some nasty things to them in the back of the squad car and dragging them down to the police station. The part that they really hate is when they have to fill out the police report at the end of the day. And, you know, they don't do that much and they don't do a very good job at it very, much, very often. And, you know, a lot of them are, you know, partially literate essentially in the first place. So um, you get a lot of screw ups like this, gate 21, gate 12, whatever. Um, United Agent told our playbook team, and then you can't read it because it's redacted, something. I was notified and went to the gate. Passenger and property were screened at the gate. Someone stated that there were several employees standing by her podium telling her that, something, and they were looking over her shoulder. Someone was also, sent, also stated that this was a distraction and someone was sent down to training for remediation. And one of the things I like to point out also is no media involved. Now, this is past, now I'm gonna explain the situation so that you really understand it. When we, went, when we showed up to the airport, um, I was familiar with those S's already because I knew another activist who was on that list and they posted it on Facebook and said, this is how you know if you're gonna get ex additional screening at the airport. So I looked for it on the ticket and it wasn't on our ticket, any of our tickets. So we went through, um, we went through security with no problems whatsoever. And then we're standing around the boarding gate. Now this is the part, I'm sure we all fly occasionally or have been in an airport, this is the part where like, when you're hanging out at the boarding gate and, and people are getting anxious, they're about to start boarding, maybe they, they do pre-boarding or whatever. So people are standing up in a crowd, like kind of around the gate, just kind of getting ready to get on the plane. And I notice at that point, uh, we are, it's my whole family, it's Teresa, Eliza, and myself, and we notice at that point, there's just about a dozen TSA and DHS, Department of Homeland Security agents, just kind of like milling around through there. Um, the crowd, and they're kind of like in couples, and the couple, two of them are like standing right next to us, and we're an all-American, you know, red-blooded family, so they're like kind of standing on their toes looking over our heads and shoulders, and we hear one of them say like, do you think it's that guy over there? Like I'm standing, <laughs> like they're looking for someone way over there. So we knew from the beginning that something was wrong. Wasn't normal situation, but then the airline employee at the little podium right before you go down the hallway makes an announcement that there's going to be random security checks. Nobody be alarmed, this is standard procedure, we're gonna have random security checks as we're boarding, and you know, it's like, if you really think about it, like we all went through security already. There's no random security checks that happen once you get through security. You made, you passed the screening. But, you know, people mostly just, you know, just went through. So we were, if you look at the ticket, which I showed earlier, we were in boarding group two, a bunch of people ahead of us. And they all got on, nobody was pulled apart, pulled aside randomly, there was no screening randomly before me. And then, you know, Teresa and Eliza went through and they were okay, and then my, I went through and I could kind of see the computer screen around the corner a little bit, this giant rectangle that says select D, it was red with white letters, select D, select D, it was like flashing on the screen. And, uh, and quickly all those, all those agents like surrounded me and like, you know, patted me down and like went through my luggage and like did chemical swab tests and all this kind of stuff. And then at the end of it, you know, of course they, they didn't find the 500 pounds of dynamite that I was trying to sneak on that airplane. So um, at the end of it, they were like, oh, we're sorry, sir. You know, sorry for the inconvenience. And then they said, one of them said to me, this all should have happened at the security gate. Totally blowing the whole cover about this being a, you know, a random security <laughs> selection, whatever. Um, and then on the, way, on the return trip, I had that on my ticket as well as, it, as we came back to Buffalo. And that went a lot more standard procedure because it was already on the ticket. But what had happened was they screwed up and didn't print it on my first ticket somehow and then figured it out as I was still in the airport and freaked out. So, um, so that's what, that's what they're talking about here in, in, this, in this narrative. Um, that people were, you know, that there was nothing in my baggage and that no media was involved. And, yeah, I think that they're very interested in this concept of being exposed. They want to make this, this list look like it's something that's random, randomly selected. 
you know, that is, that is something that's, you know, justified and is there for our safety and it's not like they've got people on a secret list and, and they really don't want any attention around it. Here's another page we got from the TSA. Uh, this here is a big block, a big redaction, and it would have been a narrative. You know, this is all the information they had here, and then they would have written a couple sentences or maybe even a couple paragraphs about what had happened. They didn't want us to see a word of that. Not a word. What, I, and I put this up here for a specific reason, but before I get into it, we also use the Freedom of Information Act on the FBI and uh, the Executive Office of the U.S. Attorney, EOUSA, or the U.S. Attorney's Office, and, um, and they didn't give us anything whatsoever. They just, just ignored it, acted as though you know, basically we never sent anything. They gave us nothing. And there are legal time limits that they're supposed to you know, comply with our requests. And they basically gave us nothing. Now, there were, other t there were other ways that we did things too. We used the Oregon state law in this case. There are a lot of states that have freedom of information laws. Here in New York, we have freedom of information law or a FOIL that is almost essentially the same thing as the federal law, but on a state level. So you can get it files from state agencies, right? And you can use the law on, on state agencies. So we use the Oregon state law on the Oregon state police, which were present at the two raids that I experienced and many other incidences when I lived out in Oregon and was speaking out for the ELF. And I put this up because it, it, it shows more of what, this is more of what we're trying to get some real information, not just photocopies of the same mail, not some like little incident report of like how someone screwed up at an airport. We want to know what they're really investigating, how and why. What is their justification for this? Um, and so, you know, a, a small agency like the Oregon State Police probably doesn't get a whole lot of Freedom of Information Act requests. And, you know, and my attorney would like to say that like half the time these are passed on to interns or subcontracted out to companies that don't really care about what they do because they get this thing in the office like, what is this? What do we do with it? And they just give it to somebody to like handle. So we got a 50 page report just on one, one investigation they had, the one, the Boise Cascade, which, I, which was one of the ones I highlighted at the beginning of this talk. Boise Cascade arson, they, did, they gave us a 50 page report of the Oregon State Police's involvement in Boise Cascade. They didn't give us anything else whatsoever, even though there were dozens of other actions that they would have been investigating just as much, but they gave us that and there's almost no redactions. Um, I'm going to read a little bit to show you what kind of picture this paints and what kind of information you actually can get at times from the Freedom of Information Act. But before I do that, I'm going to point one thing out. That P in PM is supposed to be an A. Again, this is another example of like, you know, their inability to keep accurate files. It's an A down here. They went to this house at, one point, at that time in the morning and then they went here shortly afterwards. So on March 1st, 2000, at 825 AM, ATF Special Agent John Comrie and myself attempted to contact subject number one at this address. We were contacted at the door by a female who did not identify herself. We asked the female if we could speak with subject number one. She asked who we were. And we told her that we were Special Agent Comrie, who was with the ATF, and that I was with the Oregon State Police. She asked us if we had a warrant. We responded by saying that we did not. At which point she slammed the door shut. If you skip down to the next paragraph, Special Agent Comrie and myself then attempted to contact, uh, attempted contact with subject number two. And if you were to look in these files in an earlier page, I'm subject number two, um, at this address at 8.42 a.m., which is about 20 minutes after they were at that address, which is just a few blocks away. We approached the residence. As we approached the residence, we observed a male and female leaving the area from behind the residence on bicycles. We made contact with an unknown female who told us she would wake subject number two. The unknown female closed the door and never returned. The female that left on the bicycle returned and asked us who we were, as she was also living at, I mean, they redacted the address there, but they didn't there. It's just whatever. She was also living at that address. Special Agent Comrie asked if the female was subject number three. She confirmed that she was. She informed us that she was with Subject Pickering, now they're getting lazy. I'm not subject number two anymore. I'm subject Pickering now. And that Mr. Pickering was late for a meeting and did not want to talk with us. We again collected vehicle information, whatever. They copied license plates of all the vehicles. If you can read between line, if you understand what's going on at this point, this is 2000. We've been dealing with federal grand jury subpoenas since 1997. Um, they didn't just come around to ask us questions anymore. Every time they came around it was with a grand jury subpoena. This is a coordinated effort between 
two houses in this case, which I can't even remember, but this is one of a number of coordinated efforts of grand jury resistance. You know, they go to one house at 8.25 in the morning, a couple blocks around the corner, they go to another house 20 minutes later, I'm out the back door on a bicycle because I've got such an important meeting at 8.42 a.m. that I just can't even, you know, it's obviously this is grand jury resistance. And so this is the kind of information that you can see about how they investigate and what, and what they're finding out about the movement if you actually get paperwork that is not really redacted. And I just like to point that out because that's the type of stuff that we're after. We also, even though there weren't any recent situations with, um, with, the, with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is now the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, um, underneath the Justice Department, um, even though we hadn't had any recent incidents with them, we decided to f use the Freedom of Information Act on them, too. Why not? I had had a lot of experience with them back in Oregon to see if we can find anything. They totally denied our request altogether, and they gave this reason. At, at this time, the above investigation is still open. So even though the FBI wasn't claiming to have an open investigation, uh, no other agencies were claiming to have an open investigation. ATF was claiming that they weren't going to give us anything whatsoever because it would hamper the investigation that they had on, going on. All along, we knew that we were going to have to sue. That was the point. And, uh, you know, we know... Mike Kuzma, who's, who's to my right here, has a lot of experience with the Freedom of Information Act. He did a lot of work for Leonard Peltz here with the Freedom of Information Act and many other people um, and situations. And we know how these, how these agencies work. Suing was, a, was an expectation. We just had to get to the point where we had the legitimacy to sue, right? So we had to exhaust our means. So on June 26th of 2013, we filed a federal lawsuit, a FOIA lawsuit, against the FBI, the U.S. Post Office, the Transportation Security Administration, and the Executive Office of U.S. Attorney, the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, and that's being litigated in court right now. Um, along the way, we got more press. Esker Radical Spokesman sues for FBI aid data. FBI declines to comment on Pickering's suit. During the case, which is not yet resolved, the FBI has already admitted, if you read this, that they're the ones that got the Post Office to, to copy my mail. The FBI sought U.S. Postal Inspection Service assistance in furtherance of a domestic terrorist investigation into eco-terrorism. Love that. Activities by a specific individual, which is yours truly. So while we're still fighting to get the documents in court, they've already admitted that they're the ones behind it. FBI asked for Pickering, tracking a Pickering mail in 2013. We filed another lawsuit once we got the ATF letter back, saying that they had an open investigation and thought we'd sue the, sue the ATF as well. At this point... The latest, is that on September 11th, we had a court date of this year, um, just last month, and the attorney representing the government told the judge and my attorneys that there were tens of thousands of pages on me. Tens of thousands of pages, which um, if you're familiar with, with files or not, you know, that's an astronomical amount um, of surveillance and documentation. And they, regarding the ATF, they said there was, quote, more reasonable amount of pages. They said they could process the ATF pages by the end of the year, but that the FBI pages were going to take three years to process, three years before we got them. Um, my attorney argued in court, one of my attorneys argued in court that we need a more specific number. How are we just supposed to take the FBI on faith that it's going to take them three years? Like, we want to know, like, we want a page count. And the government responded saying, well, we haven't finished counting yet, but we know there's at least 30,000. So, um, tens of thousands of pages is a lot, you know. It's not like I didn't, it's not like I thought they were, they weren't paying any attention to me. It's not like I thought they really stopped paying attention to me after I was spokesperson for the ELF, but it's also pretty shocking and uh, stressful to think that they've, been, that they've been accumulating tens of thousands of pages. Tens of thousands of pages. I mean, who are they working for, right? What are they, what are they doing? Like, this is a lot of time. This is a lot of resources. Like, for, if you look at a police report, all the work that goes into filling out a one-page police report is a lot more than just the time that it takes to fill out that paragraph. I mean, this is a lot, a lot 
of resources being allocated to this. And it just seems like, you know, we are told that we have these freedoms, right? We're told that we have, we're raised to believe that we have the freedom of speech, that we have freedom of press, we have freedom of association, and that these things are what make our country so wonderful that we have these great freedoms, these liberties. We can express our opinions regardless of whether anyone likes them or not. You know, that, that in fact, it's the, if you watch some of these like Hollywood dramas, it's the, the opinions that people don't like that are the ones that are most important to protect and what makes this country so great. And, and you know, I'm sorry, tens of thousands of pages, if you don't really have the right to free speech, then, then don't tell people that they have that. Right? I mean, if we really thought that, you know, if I, ex if I thought that I was going to be exercising the freedom of speech for the next 17 years back in 1997, if I thought that I was going to be exercising freedom of speech for the next 17 years or the rest of my life, that I would be accumulate tens of thousands of pages on me by the government, then, you know, maybe I wouldn't have done that, right? I mean, maybe a lot of us wouldn't be doing what we think we, what we were doing right now if we really thought that we, that we didn't have these freedoms. You know? If you live in like a truly fascist government, then, then you fight differently. But if you're fooled to believe that you live in a free place where ideas are exchanged and changes happen organically, then you work differently. You know, the people who are fighting over in one country where there's bombs exploding everywhere and there's war going on, they're working for freedom and justice one way because it's relevant to their situation. And then the people who are living in a country where they believe that they have all these freedoms and all this uh, ability to affect change peacefully, they're working another way, and that would make sense. But the trick is that they're, they're, we're being lied to. You know, we, you know, we don't really have these freedoms the way that we think we do. If you're, uh, it, all I've ever done is exercise the freedom of speech. And by now they all know that. They know that. But they don't care. They haven't indicted me in 17 years on any of this stuff. Right? 17 years, but they're still going to monitor every single thing I do. Uh, tens of thousands of pages. I don't know how many pages at this point, but tens of thousands is mind-blowing to me. It's just mind-blowing to me. You know, and I just don't think, I think it's a good example of, 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 of just how screwed up, how screwed up this whole system is. Right? Of course, it's not the best example, but it's a good example of how screwed up this, this whole thing is. We have a bookstore. We sell books. I do interviews for the media, right? I speak at college campuses. You know, I don't put my daughter to bed at night and throw on a mask and go burn down buildings. I just don't do that, right? I don't think that for a second that I could get away with that because they're monitoring me with tens of thousands of pages of documents, right? And so if I really thought that, that was the way that the whole system was, back when I was 19 years old, the first time the FBI came to my house, then maybe I would have just done something else. But in the meantime, you know, I had some little, some little glimmer of hope that you know, we could change things through, through legal, peaceful exercising of our rights and the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. And I just want to hammer home that it's all a smokescreen. You know, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter if you're doing anything legal or illegal or not, or peaceful or not peaceful, if you are affecting change in any way. It doesn't matter if, you know, you could be a Black Panther or you could be, a, you could be a, someone who's working for, um, you know, environmentalism, right? The moment that you start in f making some real tangible progress is the moment that they start repressing you. And the one thing that is really, really important to understand is that we don't lose, I mean, we have a great losing track record in, our, in all our freedom struggle movements, unfortunately. We, we've, we're pretty good at losing. Um, we win sometimes as well, and I don't want to make it seem like we always lose, but we do a good job at losing. And um, the reason that we lose isn't because we don't have any better ideas or any other you know, better way to do things, or that we don't have enough people, or that we don't put enough resources into it, or that we aren't dedicated enough. Then that's none of that. That's not why we lose. The reason that we lose is because the moment that we start to win, the government represses us. And they'll repress us with the nicest way they can do it just to make sure that we stop, you know, just to stop us. But if we don't stop, then they'll repress us harder. And, and, if, and if we really don't stop at that point, then they'll repress us even harder to the point where you're dead in Fred Hampton's bed. Or beyond that, because they can go much, much more beyond that if they want. And um, that's the reason why we fail. 
you know, because really it's a setup. <laughs> and uh, they will do really, really horrible things to people who are winning gains the way that they don't want them to win. And uh, they want you to just vote, and they want you to sign petitions, and whatever, whatever, and as long as it's not really going to change things, it's okay. As long as it placates us, it's okay, but the moment that we start to actually win things, it's not really about whether it's legal or illegal, whether it's underground or above ground. It's about whether it works or not, whether it's achieving goals or not, and that's when they start repressing people. One other point I want to make quickly is the importance in resisting repression. I'll tell a quick story. This isn't the first time that I've been under a mail cover. Um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, one of our postal carriers came up to our porch where we were hanging out outside and, and it just asked us, like, why is it that I gotta write down all the return addresses on your, on, your, um, on your envelopes? And then proceeded to show us this pad where these addresses were copied down for days prior. And we were just like, I don't know, you know? But at the same time, like, we knew, right? We were under investigation. These tens of millions of dollars were happening, damages were happening, and we were the only people that were, you know, that they could affiliate in any way whatsoever with these things, and so we were under investigation. We were being raided by the FBI, et cetera. And at the time, I had a different mentality, you know? And a lot of us in the movement had a different mentality. It was like, you don't want to complain about repression because you don't want to ma be made to look like you can't handle it. Or you don't want to make it look like you're trying to look like you're special because you're, you're receiving repression, that you're someone special, you know? So you just kind of like play it cool and you stay focused on your goal, right? You stay focused on the offensive because the moment you start, fighting repression, you're on the defensive. And we were wanting to shut these companies down and shut these government agencies down and to save the forest. And we didn't really want to deal with repression. So we stayed on the offensive. And there's something really strong and powerful about that, right? There's something beautiful about that. And I wouldn't want to stop anyone from staying on the offensive when their struggle is winning by any means. But at the same time, I think it's really important to realize the power of repression, and we would find that out personally in the years that followed, when repression wasn't just being put on a couple people anymore, but was put a broad, on a broad scale across the whole movement, and all of a sudden everyone just disappeared, everyone gave up, everyone was gone, and by the time 2003 came around, it was like there was no radical environmental movement at all, almost. Um, and we didn't see that coming, we didn't understand that, because we didn't really understand history very well. And I think that's very important that Whenever you're subjected to repression, whether it's a grand jury subpoena, whether even it's just a cop playing good cop, bad cop at a protest arrest or whatever, resist it. Resist it. You know, don't think it's just a small thing and it's just about you and that you, know, you can just tough it out. Resist it, make a big deal about it, you know, get the public behind you. Hold them accountable. Tens of thousands of pages on me, I want to hold them accountable. Like, I want to do everything I can to make people to understand you know, that this isn't, this isn't cool. Right? This, isn't a, this isn't how a free country operates at all. This has got nothing to do with free country. This has a lot to do with fascism. You know? And so even if it's like a much less scale than that, a smaller scale, you know, if, if someone is being subjected to repression in your community, support them. It doesn't matter if you're, they're your friends or not. It doesn't matter if you like them or not. Right? Support them. Stand behind them. Everything that I've been able to do is because I've had support from my community um, and, thank, you know, and, and Burning Books has been able to stay open through all this and actually thrive through all this because of support in our community. And I just want to say thank you for everyone who came out here tonight to listen to this because it's this kind of support that makes all the difference. Um, we need to remember what it is and this is why I put it up here, put this up here. We need to remember what it is that we stand for in the first place. That's one thing that I've found very, very, very important in my years of resisting repression is that if I, st if I forget even for a moment what it is that I'm fighting for and, de and defending, if I forget that, you know, that I'm trying to protect the earth and that they're doing these horrible things and that I'm trying to get these people out of prison and they're doing these horrible things and my friends have been in prison for decades you know, for, for things that they should be really given medals for, um, and if I forget that, and I start just thinking about, oh no, they're going to indict me, oh no, they're going to raid me again, that's when you get scared and that's when you start making bad decisions. If you keep what you stand for and what you believe on in, in the front of your mind, you're going to be way, way better able, uh, capable uh, to resist repression because you understand that they're trying to stop us from winning, right? And we're in this, and this is why we're in this, so thank you. <laughs>